There we go. So what we'll go through today is a summary of our work that's focused on the barley genome. And just a little bit of background, barley is a, a, quite a simple genetic system to work with and, and in some ways very simple in terms of genomics. It's a diploid. Uh, it has seven chromosomes. Um, <clears throat> along with being a diploid, it's primarily inbreeding, so we can work with uh, individuals generally that have a single haplotype, which simplifies things enormously with assemblies, etc. So what makes it a bit more complicated is, is its size. It's about 5.3 gigabase, about double the size of the human genome, double the size of the maize genome. It's about 36 times the size of the Arabidopsis genome, 12 times the size of rice, and uh, about nine times the size of cowpea. I mentioned cowpea here because we've used the same fundamental approach of, uh, to back sequencing for, for cowpea, but for its whole genome. Whereas here with barley, as I'll come to shortly, we focused on just a portion of the genome that's gene enriched. And uh, so barley, along with its large size, is composed mainly of highly repetitive DNA, like more than 90% highly repetitive DNA. And it's this highly repetitive DNA that confounds uh, sequence assemblers, makes it it's too repetitive for, to get a complete whole genome shotgun sequence from today's uh, uh, economical uh, short read sequencing methods. So a very common starting point where I should say that the size and the difficulty in getting the, the complete base by base genome does not stop the barley community nor practically any other community from going forward toward meeting practical objectives through the development of genome resources. So a very common starting point is illustrated in this slide where here we've depicted roughly seven chromosomes or seven linkage groups of barley. The little uh, black ovals indicate approximate positions of centromeres and the tick marks along each linkage group are to indicate, uh, are to indicate uh, uh, SNP, uh, markers of various types. We tend to use SNPs or single polymorphism markers. So a common starting point is that someone has studied a trait and by looking at its inheritance, been able to position uh, a trait determinant somewhere on the genetic map mark, uh, relative to SNP markers. So a, a question that comes up from various perspectives is, what candidate genes or what genes are in this region? And there's various reasons for wanting to know that. For breeding, one might want to develop the perfect marker, a marker directly on top of the trait determinant, exactly marking the position of genetic variability. For others, uh, the drive might be the, this human instinct have that why do you go to the top of the mountain because it's there? Why do you want to know what gene is there? Because I want to know. I want to have a full knowledge. So there's a mechanistic drive for pure basic research interests. But the mechanistic drive actually helps lead to the perfect markers so that the two, uh, the two motivations really go together. So thinking about what we can do even without a whole genome sequence in barley and other uh, organisms, uh, let's consider a zoom in view. <clears throat> if we consider again the linkage group with a trait and zoom in to uh, the, the red box would indicate uh, the position of a trait as position, let's say, by QTL mapping where the precise locus isn't known but a range with high likelihood of position is known. So one might have a, um, a physical map, and we'll come to an explanation of that in a bit more detail here very shortly, but uh, we can depict uh, a physical map here by these little vertical lines. If one's gone through the process of making um, a back library, which again I'll explain briefly, and uh, joining all the pieces together computationally, one can derive a minimal tiling path, which is uh, the minimal representation of overlap overlapping and ideally connecting segments of the genome, then one can have this zoom in view where within your region of a trait you might know a couple SNP markers and you might have an overlay knowledge of, of um, physical map. <clears throat> so looking again at a zoom in view we can think about well what if we sequence all those backs? Uh, so we, we can do that. We can and, and we have in our, in our project sequence all the backs that we've worked with which are a gene rich portion not the whole genome. The whole genome is being approached in a larger coordinated effort within the International Barley Genome Sequencing Consortium that we participate in. 
but our work uh, dates back some years and has focused on a concept of uh, sort of shrinking the barley genome by focusing only on gene-rich gene portion. So one can take the backs and sequence them as we have, and from that, even without having complete base-by-base end-to-end back sequences, one can still gain knowledge about which backs carry gene sequences. So that's depicted here. One can uh, get knowledge and uh, be able to overlay positions of genes. Not, and you don't, for the purpose of answering the question of what candidate genes are in this region, you don't need to really know uh, exactly the base-by-base -base knowledge. If you just know which genes are in which backs, it, it really gets to the heart of that initial question. And that's been our goal. So barley genome, let's review again here briefly. Bacterial artificial chromosome, BAC, B-A-C stands for bacterial artificial chromosome. Um, these are generally 100 to 150 kilobase fragments of the, of the genome propagated on self-replicating replicating plasmids within the bacterium E. coli. So they can be grown in quantity and cut into pieces and sequenced and analyzed, etc. So what we also know from studies uh, dating back more, even more than 10 years ago that genes are not distributed evenly along the, the barley genome. And I think this is true for most plants, in fact but they tend to be clustered in gene-rich regions. And so what, what, what was known and what we've observed and confirmed with our sequencing is that a bat carrying one gene, if you find a bat carrying one gene, it's likely that it carries more than one gene. So uh, finding one gene, gene, carry, gene bearing bat takes you to a, uh, tends to take you to a gene-enriched portion of the genome. So for barley, we've utilized that characteristic for this selective sequencing. Um, we first went through a process that we won't describe in detail over multiple years, identifying gene-enriched backs using genic probes. These were then built into a physical map, as depicted in an earlier slide, and a minimal tiling path was uh, calculated from the, the deeper uh, coverage uh, back physical map. So <clears throat> come to more illustrations of fingerprinting here briefly as a reminder to those who may not know how that works. So there are some pros and cons to consider. The pros of uh, what's the advantage of sequencing the genome one back at a time versus whole genome shotgun? Well, the pros, you, you can be selective, as, as we have, so you, it can, you can go through a process of gene enrichment. The work can be distributed across several labs, as, as it is now in the International Barley Sequencing Consortium. Beyond the work that we've done, there's an effort to sequence the entire uh, barley genome. Our work, again, is focused on a gene-rich portion. The assembly can, carry, be, can, carry it out, can be carried out back by back, uh, um, which helps to deal with highly, highly repetitive sequences. So a sequence that might be present, say, 200 times in the genome can't be assembled uh, in a whole genome context, but it may then occur only once within a back, and so then within a single back, it's not repetitive and it can be assembled. So you get more sequence uh, completion back by back versus whole genome. Cons of this approach, you need a back library and an overlap map to start with, and then that involves some serious time and effort and resource. But many communities have already followed this path. The barley community has, and so have many, many others. They already have back libraries and overlap map. A con about back by back sequencing is that when you purify the back DNA, you can't get away from E. coli DNA, so you lose some of your value in sequences there, sequencing E. coli over and over again. Not too bad of an issue you can filter out with a reference data set. And another issue, big issue, is you need to handle a large number of individual samples. And it's the combinatorial pooling method that we've developed and used that tackles this, this last point pretty directly, shrinking the number of individual samples quite a lot. As uh, Stefano will describe later, the approach that we've used most of the time uh, made about a 24-fold reduction in the number of samples you have to handle. He'll go through that in more detail. So the outcome of the method that we've developed for uh, combinatorial sequencing of BACs leads to, minimally at least, this type of information, where if you consider uh, part of a, a minimal tiling path, you have two BACs that overlap. So one gene is covered by one BAC, and another gene is covered by two BACs in this illustration, and the overlap positions between the backs defines three bins. 
bounded by the ends of the backs, one, two, and three. And so our sequencing method allows us to allocate sequences to each bin. So the level of resolution minimally that we obtain is genes within these, um, these uh, back bins. In, in reality, the ordering is a bit more complete than that, and as time goes on and more types of information are added, we see the ordering improved as things move toward, uh, but probably never reaching exactly, complete base-by-base end-to-end sequencing. But this level of sequence knowledge goes back to the slide earlier. What genes are in the vicinity or what candidate genes are in the region of interest? So this level of knowledge helps answer that question. So the, we started with one library, one Morex Barley Back Library. It was published uh, in the year 2000, and it was, it was very, wi very widely used for map-based cloning and market development efforts by people in the barley community. And there's quite a legacy of published literature and work regarding this particular library. There are more Morex Barley libraries that have been made now and have been incorporated into the whole Genome uh, International Barley Sequencing Consortium effort. But we focused only on this one library. And what we began many years ago was probing that library for gene bearing backs. And so we, we found about 84,000, about one fourth of the total library um, backs that had evidence that they were gene positive. And we estimate now that that's roughly about 70 to 75 percent of all the genes that are in this library that we've. we've caught them in this method. These were then fingerprinted using high information content fingerprinting, which is a method uh, using restriction endonuclease that was developed by Ming Cheng Luo at UC Davis. And he was also the person who did the high information content fingerprinting for this project. The method essentially is that if each of these lines is one back DNA and, and the tick marks are sites of restriction enzymes, when clipped with the restriction enzyme and generates a series of fragments. And so here is indicated a number string that's meant to indicate uh, the length of fragments that are generated. And so then many, um, so uh, two backs are declared overlapping if they share a large number of common lengths. And this is using a method that was developed by Carrie Soderland, who is at Sanger Institute, now at Arizona Genomics Institute. She developed this method called FPC, so computational assembly of, uh, of fragments to make uh, contiguous uh, associations of backs. So the word contig is the abbreviated term, the contiguous alignment of fragments. So ultimately end up with these types of contigs. A set of overlapping backs is a contig. So from a set of overlapping backs, in, if you're interested in doing what we were, sequencing the contig, it's not necessary to sequence all those backs, but one can compute a minimal tiling path, which ideally would run from one end of the contig all the way to the other using the minimum number of clones. So we went through that process, <clears throat> and um, uh, in our work, we ended up with 15,720 of these, quote, gene-bearing backs uh, that were all part of minimal tiling path. And when we add up their sizes, it's roughly 1.7 or 1,700 megabase or 1.7 gigabase, or almost one-third of the size of the whole barley genome. And as I said, within that one-third, our, our estimates now are that, that within that is about roughly 70, 75 percent of all the genes that are in this library. So now I hand you back to Stefano.